Good morning. Merry Christmas. Thanks for being here this morning. I've got something that you need to have right here. This says, eventually, the wait is over, FBC Christmas Advent Prayer Journal. Have you seen these yet? They are out in the lobby. Do not take one. You hear me? Do not take one. Take two. Do not take one. Take two. One for you and your family, and then one to give to somebody else, a family, somebody else in your family, a friend, a coworker. Someone who you think will really enjoy this. And of course, as, as you look through it, when you pick one up, you'll see uh, several days. You go day by day through the Advent season with a, a scripture and a devotional thought, some room for you to journal. So the way you do this is you read the scripture, and this is a really great way to do a devotion. Read one scripture, allow God to speak to you through that one scripture throughout the day. There's a space in here for you to write down some things that God shows you through that. And then on Saturdays every week, special kids activities. Also, if you go to FBC Elgin online, there's a little more detail about those. So if you want to work through those crafts with the kids in your life, your children, your grandchildren, uh, other, other, uh, your nieces, your nephews, whoever it would be, go to FBC Elgin uh, online and you can see a little more detail about how to do that. So please, 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 we're going to do this together. Have a great time with this journal. So remember, do not take one. Take two of these when you go today. Take two of these, one for you and one for somebody else. So you're ready for Christmas? You're ready, aren't you? I'm ready. Do you know why you celebrate Christmas? Now, it's not because your, your children make you or because you're married to someone named Griswold, okay? But that's a pretty good, those are not invalid reasons. But you really do know why you celebrate Christmas. You know why you started celebrating Christmas, too, if you really think about it. Somebody introduced you to Christmas, most likely when you were a child. Someone introduced you to Christmas. Someone took you perhaps to see Santa Claus. We got a picture of Santa? Yeah. <laughs> most kids were happy about seeing Santa Claus. Maybe not you, not everyone. Yeah, there's some pictures there. <laughs> That's, right. Even Santa cried on that one, right? It was so bad. Even got to, got to Santa. It's interesting. when uh, You know that you're getting older because Santa starts to look younger. Show the Santa I saw at the mall the other day. Show the next picture. Where's Santa? Have we got Santa? Yeah, that was Santa at the mall. Yeah, the 20-something-year-old the girls were trampling the 5-year-olds. That did not seem right to get to him. Well, when you're young, Santa, Santa looks old and, and, and you love Santa and you start to figure out how this Santa thing works because he's making a list and he's checking it twice and he's going to find out who's naughty and nice and Santa Claus is coming to town. And you say, which town? Well, your town, whichever town you happen to live in. And so each December 25th at the beginning of winter, uh, Santa Claus comes to town. Now, Santa Claus is this large man dressed in red pajamas, and he'd be creepy if he drove a van, but fortunately for everyone, he drives a sleigh, and the sleigh is pulled by eight tiny reindeer, and one reindeer has a flashing red nose. You know, when, when, you're, when somebody first told you that, when your parents first told you that, didn't you ask them, are you guys still taking drugs? Are you still taking drugs? How do you come up with that? But you discover that Santa Claus brings toys to you, toys that you wanted but your parents couldn't afford. And as it turns out, the very best thing about this is that even if I was naughty and not nice, he still brought me toys. That making a list, checking it twice thing, that's just a parental behavior motivation modification tool. He still brings you those gifts. So you did that Christmas thing every year. You started to learn about that. And, and over the years, as you grew up, you learned more about it. You learned more about Santa Claus. For instance, when I was growing up, our house didn't have a chimney. So my father had to explain to me, how, how does Santa come to a house when you don't have a chimney? And my dad explained it to me in the most logical way. Santa comes in a helicopter to places that don't have a chimney and lands on your roof and brings you presents. Problem solved. So you learn about that. You learn about how your family and your extended family celebrates Christmas. Most everyone celebrates Christmas. Some people don't exactly know why they do that or, or, or really know who Christmas is all about. And, and some people don't want to buy into the hype of the commercial promotions. But most, most people celebrate Christmas. Most families have some sort of traditions or practices or rituals. I bet you do too. By a show of hands, how many of you make Christmas cookies? Where are the Christmas? Okay, that's, that's a lot of you. How many of you eat Christmas cookies? That's another tradition. Yeah, that's everybody. We do that. Yeah, H how about this? Who has, who has Christmas dinner or dinners with different sides of your family? Right, depending on who's available and who gets along with who and all that. 
I understand. Who, who has that one relative? Who, who of you has that one relative at Thanksgiving or Christmas or at both that always starts that conversation about religion or politics that makes everyone awkward? Okay? Yeah, if you're not raising your hand, you're probably the one in that family. That's right. They're thinking about you. Right. Who, who goes out of town or has family come visit and stay with you at Christmas? Who does that? Some of us do that. You do realize a Homeland Security passed a new regulation this year. If, if someone comes to visit you after two days, it's reclassified from a visit to a hostage situation. So keep that in mind as you go through Christmas. New regulations. Okay, so you do that. Uh, some folks go Black Friday shopping. Other folks have a tradition of going to look at the Christmas lights. Other folks have decorating traditions. Many people leave milk and cookies out for Santa. A lot of us, a lot of us did that. A lot of us have the tradition of eating those cookies before Santa gets to them. So that's a good tradition as well. So somewhere along the line, you picked up on all your family's Christmas traditions, started to learn about Christmas. Somewhere along the line... You were introduced to the Christmas celebration as the birth of Jesus. Now, for some of you, that was when you were children. Perhaps your parents were followers of Jesus or your grandparents or, or, or at least they attended church, even if only at Christmas and Easter or, or maybe more regularly. But either way, as a child, somewhere, many of you were told the biblical story of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. And if you weren't told it, you at least watched a Charlie Brown Christmas, Correct which will be added to newer translations of the Bible starting this year. So that's really good. So for others of you, uh, it was later in life, and, and you heard about and you began to investigate, and you took seriously Christmas as the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And perhaps some of you are even here this morning, and you're in, still in that process right now. If so, you are at the right place at the right time right now. And timing truly is everything. You've got great timing this year because for today and for the next four Sundays until Christmas, we're going to talk about and here at First B, we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. It's going to be a party all month long. And, and, and uh, some of you have known about it for a long time. You celebrate every year. Others, you, you didn't learn about it quite as early. Some of you are learning about it now. Some of you have been waiting a really long time. I, I think there's actually some value to having to wait. We don't like it, do we? When God was handing out patience, some of you were in another line, I'm sure. A shorter line, a faster line, I'm sure. But you, I don't know what you got instead of patience. But there's value in waiting sometimes. Uh, Handel H. Brown writes this, especially at Christmas. He says, Christmas has lost its meaning for us because we've lost the spirit of expectancy. We cannot prepare for an observance. We must prepare for an experience. And Christmas is an experience. Perhaps you've, you've had experiences of, of, of Christmas that, that you couldn't wait for them to be over. But there is an experience of Christmas that's worth waiting for. And it's almost here. So if you've been waiting, the, the wait is almost over. Christmas this year is called, here at First B, is called Adventually. Adventually. And, uh, and it's, it's the blending together of the words Advent, which means coming, Jesus is coming, his arrival, and eventually, which means something will happen at some point in another time. So Advent and eventually, eventually, please tell me that you get it. I hope that you get that. And, and so we're excited about that. We've been waiting. We anticipate this season. And, and now the opportunity for us to, to realize and to celebrate Jesus Christ at Christmas and to celebrate the gift of life that he brings. We introduced the series last week. We learned that timing is everything and that Jesus came at exactly the right time. Galatians chapter 4. When the right time came, God sent his son. So we might say that he was eventually yours. The, the gift of Jesus came into the world at exactly the right time. And what's more, he comes into our lives at exactly the right time. Some, sometimes we've been waiting. Sometimes we haven't been waiting. Sometimes, sometimes we, we wanted things to happen quicker and they didn't. Other times we weren't even paying attention to it, but the timing was right. It comes into your life at the right time. But knowing the timing, as important as that is, and the right time in the right place, doesn't always tell us why something happened or why it's significant. But eventually starts with why starts with why. Now, many times, why is a difficult thing to get a handle on. And so we, we tend to gravitate toward questions like questions of what and how because those questions seem more manageable and they seem more measurable. They seem more practical and we like that. Why seems so abstract and sometimes we just can't find satisfying answers to questions of why. 
Now, there are some questions out there. I, you know, I've thought about these for years. That there are always questions out there like this. And I can't find a good answer to this. Why are men's and women's shoe sizes different? You ever thought about that? It's just these numbers. Why are they different? Why, why do they call it a TV set when you only get one? Does that make you think about that? Why does everyone duck when someone yells, heads up? Thought about that? Everyone does. How about this? Why doesn't a psychic ever win the Mega Millions lottery? Think about that. I, I mean, I just wonder, why, why does caregiver and caretaker mean exactly the same thing? Why do drugstores make people who are ill walk all the way to the back of the store to get a prescription? While healthy people can buy cigarettes in the front of the store. Is that not strange to you? Why is Charlie short for Charles even though they have exactly the same number of letters? And why in the world is abbreviation such a long word? I don't know. I can't find answers to those questions. And there are some why questions that there just are no answers to. But there is an answer to why at the right time, in the right place, to the right people, did Jesus come? Eventually starts with why. Read this with me. This is the most famous verse in the Bible. This in the 23rd Psalm. Read this out loud with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Here's why. Eventually, here's why. Because he's not the God you don't believe in. He loves. For God so loved the world. Now, I know there are people, even at Christmas time, there are people who don't believe in God at all. And I think the, the rather famous atheist philosophy, Richard Dawkins, speaks for, uh, for all of them when he writes this. And this is true as well. He says, we are all atheists about most of the gods that humanity has ever believed in. Because humanity has believed in a lot of gods and all kinds of gods in different places. Some of us just go one god further. One god too far for most people. But yet I remember the story of a professor talking about various students he had over the years who were self-proclaimed atheists, which simply means that they don't believe in God. Atheist, theos is the Greek word for God, and, and a in Greek is the, uh, what they call a negative particle. You put that in front of a word, and it just means no on any of this. It negates that. So they don't believe that there's a God. And he said he would talk to professors, uh, he would talk to students who didn't believe in God, and he would invite them to come to his office, and he would ask them, hey, tell me about the God you don't believe in. Perhaps I don't believe in that God either. And he said, very rarely was the God they didn't believe in, the God proclaimed in John 3.16, because this God, he loves. This God so loves the world. The crazy thing about this God is that he loves, and he loves the world, and he loves you. And that's a bit tricky for us to know exactly what this word means, because we use this word love in so many different ways. It can be so confusing. On any given day, I can use the word love to describe how I feel about my wife, and also how I feel about a package of white fudge Oreo cookies. I love both of them with all of my heart, and I want to hold each of them as often as I can. The Bible says a lot about love, and the NIV version English version of the Bible, love occurs, the word love occurs 567 times from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, to the last book, Revelation. And it has some different shades of meaning. One of them found in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verse 15, uh, is the Hebrew word, H-A-S-A-Q, hasak, hasak in there, meaning to attach yourself to someone or to something, that, that the Lord does that, that he loves you by attaching himself to you. It always reminds me of this, these leashes that you see people put on their children. When they carry them around, it's like a uh, show. That, have we got the picture of the leash for the kids? Bring that up. There it is. You know, before I, had, before I had a child, I thought that was the most demeaning and humiliating thing in the world. And then you have a child and you go, hey, that's not such a bad idea. Because they won't run off like that. But that's the phrase. In, in, in the, the Deuteronomy passage there, that's the phrase that God for love is that he would attach himself to someone. And it's talking particularly there about him attaching himself to the people of Israel, God attaching himself, leashing himself to them, making that kind of commitment to them. It's a different word in John 3.16. It's a, it's a Greek word, the Greek word uh, apose, agapeson, from agape, which means to love. And it's a, it's a, it's a love that, that it rooted in sacrifice, not, not a spontaneous, impulsive love like we hear about in songs and see in movies, but it's a, it's a love rooted in sacrifice and in a sacrificial commitment. Because God's love is not primarily a feeling 
but it's a contemplating, it's a choosing, it's a committing type of love. It's the type of love that everyone wants to receive, but very few people want to give because there's sacrifice involved. It's not just a good feeling based on you being lovable, but it's God's commitment to you. He so loves the world, he so loves you, and he loves me. Not because you're a good person or because you're not. He's not going to love you any more if you're a better person or any less if you're not. He's not going to love you anymore because you have something to contribute or, or, because, or he won't quit loving you because you have nothing left to give. I always think about this story. When, when my dad was still alive, he lived for about two years at a place called The Vines here in Elgin. It's a senior care home. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. And while he was there, there was a woman who was also there who, who couldn't talk anymore and she didn't respond much at all. She, could, she couldn't feed herself. She couldn't do anything like that. And I remember in, in the midst of seeing how sad that was, we saw one of the most beautiful things that I'll never forget. Her husband, and they'd been married a long time, her husband would come in every day. He, he was still living at his, at his house on his own. He, he would come in every day at breakfast and at lunch and at dinner, and he would feed her. At breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He would come in and he would feed her, and he did that until she died. And do you know why he did that? And you do know, exact, you know exactly why he did that. Because he loved her. Because he loved her and he was committed to her. God loves you and he has committed himself to you. And he doesn't love you even so much because of who you are. He loves you because of who he is. Because he is a God who loves. He is a God who commits himself to you. It's not just a feeling, it's a decision and it's an action. For God so loved the world, and then this great next part, that he gave because Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving, he gives. Love is action. And here's how you know the why is true, because God's great love motivates him to action and to give. Someone can say they love you all day long. The way you know that's true is because of action. God gives. Let me, let me ask you, maybe you'll remember this. If it hasn't happened to you yet, this will, this will happen to you at some point. You get married when you have children, or you get your parents or your grandparents something they wanted. But, but when this happens to you, the first time that, you, uh, that for you, giving a gift was more fun than receiving a gift. Have you had that experience yet? When giving a gift was more fun than actually receiving a gift. Every, every parent's had that experience with, with their children. So we're, we're giving that gift and seeing the impact of that is more fun than getting gifts. So maybe you knew someone wanted something so special and you, you had gotten it for them and you couldn't wait to, to, to experience that when they received it. So, so it, was like, it was like that Christmas that Rebecca, my wife Rebecca, surprised me with a brand new Harley Davidson, like that Christmas. <laughs> oh, my bad, that Christmas hasn't happened yet. I'm preaching prophetically this morning. That's marvelous. The very first Christmas in Bethlehem was that Christmas for God. The very first Christmas in Bethlehem was that Christmas for God. He so loved the world that he gave. God loves, and giving is what love does. Giving is how love expresses itself. Giving is the heart of love, and therefore giving is the heart of God. God is a giver and not a taker. God's a giver, not a taker. People always thought the gods were, were takers. And, and, and much mythology, in much human belief about gods and God or so-called gods, gods are takers and not, not givers. But, but this God, from the very first book in the Bible to the last book in the Bible, is revealing himself to be a giver and not a taker. James chapter 1, verse 17. We read a little bit of this last week. I love this verse and the, and the, the specific wording here. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. The key word is every gift, not just good gifts, not just perfect gifts, not just gifts that you have. Every good gift, and it brings God joy to give to you. Every good gift he gives to you. And not only good gifts, but he gives the greatest gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. One and only, or only begotten there in, in, in the old uh, language is the word monogenes, M-O-N-O, -O, and then genes. It, exactly like it sounds, mono and genes, a compound adjective, a very special adjective, a very, very powerful adjective. Mono means one or only, and genes means species or race or family or, or offspring. And it's usually, uh, in the Bible, it's, it's used mostly to talk about uh, someone's child, a parent-child relationship, the only son of his of, of his mother, the only daughter of a father. It's used to talk about that. And God gives 
his greatest gift, his one and only son. 1 John 4, this is how God showed his love among us, that he sent his one and only son into the world, that we might live through him. God loves you so much that he would give his, his greatest gift, his greatest treasure, that he would give him as a sacrifice for us. That's the why of eventually. He loves you so much that he would give his one and only son, not just to come and become one of us, not just to live with us, but he would give him to die on a cross in your place and in my place for our sins. Romans chapter 5, again, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. But he demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Why would he do that? Because he loves you. Why Advent? Why Christmas? Why baby Jesus in a cradle? Why Jesus dying on a cross? Why all of that? Because God loves and God gives. That's why. And because this gift is for you, you believe. Because this gift is for you, you believe. You believe. We read that and we think, you know, is there something else? Is there something more? There was a time when people said, it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you believe the right things. And we've said that in church before at times that throughout history. As long as you believe the right things, it doesn't matter. And the, the pendulum kind of swings. And now we're in a place in our culture where people say, well, it really doesn't matter what you believe. You know, because we're all from different traditions and people have different religions. And it really doesn't matter what you believe. It, it's just that, that you do the right things. And, and somebody will tell you what the right things are. You know, you do these right things. You get on this, what, the right side of history, whatever that's supposed to mean. You do these good things. You do these right things. And, and that's great to do that, but doing all those things, doing all the right things is not the same as receiving the gift that God gives on Christmas. Great things to do, but not the same. The gift of Jesus is the gift that saves, and the gift that gives life beyond this earthly realm and into eternity. Luke chapter 2, the great Christmas story that we'll read more in the weeks to come. But the angel said to them, said to the shepherds, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah the Lord. The way you receive the good news of the gospel is that you believe. Your response to your acceptance of the good news where, where God loves the world and gave his one and only son is not primarily to do good works. It's to believe. Believe in him. You won't perish, but you'll have eternal life. And when you believe in him, you will do good works. Good works follow from believing in him because he changes your life. And he's prepared. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 says he's prepared good works for us to do in advance. But the most important response to the gospel is to believe. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's good news because you're a whoever. It's good news because you're a whoever and I'm a whoever. And all of us here in whoeverville, which is right down the road from Whoville, where the Grinch lives, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have life. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's why. Because he's not the God you don't believe in. He loves. That's why. Because Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. He gives to you life. All good things. The gift is for you and so you believe. Whoever believes in him will not perish. But you say, well, now what? Okay, here we go. That's why. Now what? Well, what follows from the advent of God's love in Jesus Christ at Christmas, you believe, but then, but then what do you do? Some of you would say, look, I'm already so overwhelmed by the, the Christmas season. Now what? Now take a nap. Tired. Well, after you take your nap and for the rest of the Advent season, here's what you do. Jesus talking to his followers. Jesus teaching his followers what to do. Read this out loud with me. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Let's read together. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If the reason for Advent, if the reason for Christmas is that God sent his son, if the reason for that was his great love for all of us, for you, that then the celebration of Christmas is both to receive that 
and to share that with others. Th th that's why we told you, you know, the, the Advent booklets, we said, you can't just take one. You got to take two. Don't just take one, take two. Take one for you, take another one for someone else because you share that love that God has given with you. Here's how we do that real quick and then we'll wrap this up this morning. Number one, ponder the gift of Christmas love. Ponder the gift of Christmas love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. But we have to understand how God so loved us and I doubt we can do that without seriously reflecting upon the cross. The great Ghanaian writer, young Ghanaian writer, Layla Akita said, if we reflect, we shall recognize. If we reflect, we shall recognize. Do you do that when you see, I always think of this, I see pictures and I see statues of Jesus on the cross. And, and in the Baptist tradition, we don't really have so many of those with Jesus on the cross in the, in the actual churches. We, we just have, we have crosses, but not with Jesus on the cross. But, but when I see those, those representations of Jesus on the cross and that idea of understanding this is how God loved the world. We say, how did God love the world? That's so abstract, God loved the world. How did he do it? This is how God loved the world that sort of suffering and death for our sins, then we begin to understand how much God really loves us and how much we ought to love one another. Ephesians 5, he calls us to be imitators, to imitate God as dear children and to walk in love the same way that Christ loved us. Ponder the gift of Christmas love. Pursue the gift. Pursue the gift. Love, love is, a, is a gift from God, so you, you can't conjure it up. You can't rent it. You can't buy it. You do not simply possess it. You must receive it from God. That, that's why Christmas is not just about gifts, but about the gift from God. So you receive it. You receive it. But then in order to fully share it, you must pursue it. You must pursue it. I'm going to show you something interesting. I bet you've never noticed this. The greatest chapter in the New Testament on love is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's a whole chapter, 13 verses about love. And this is how it ends. Verse 13 ends like this. You're probably very familiar, many of you are very familiar with this. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now, stops there, but because of modern Bible translations where they put in uh, chapters and chapter headings and all these kind of things, you think, well, it's probably all that he's got to say about love is probably done at this point. And then you start chapter 14 with this very phrase, pursue love. You think it ended? And these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. All, almost the same sentence, pursue love. And that's hard work. Because people are sometimes hard to love, aren't they? It's hard to love people. Tom Lear says, I know that there are people who do not love their fellow man, and I hate people like that. Don't you feel the same way? And some people are harder to love than others. But make no mistake, every single one of us is unlovable to someone Yet Jesus says, love one another. It's a command, 13 times in the New Testament as a command. The greatest chapter on love in the Bible says we are to pursue love. The best way to do that is to spend time around loving people, starting with Jesus. Starting with Jesus. Why an Advent journal where every day you get a verse of Scripture and you get some time to spend with Jesus? You want to become a loving person? Spend some time around loving people. I read an old sermon by Henry Drummond, who's like a, an old preacher from the 1800s, and he said this. He said, if you take a piece of ordinary steel, old cold steel, ordinary steel, he said, and you attach it to a magnet, and you leave that steel attached to the magnet for a while, the magnetism of the magnet passes onto the steel, the steel becomes a magnet as well. As you stay attached to Jesus, his love will pass into you and then out to others. When we receive God's love in our heart, it, it creates a reservoir of love that you can share. So stay attached to one who loves. Here's the second thing, and maybe you never thought about this. Stop practicing the other one another's that are easier but not taught by Jesus. Love one another's the hard one. Love one another. We practice these other one another's that are not taught by Jesus but are just easier. How about this? Maybe you've been practicing these one another's. Scrutinize one another. Pressure one another. Embarrass one another. Corner one another, interrupt one another, defeat one another, shame one another, marginalize one another, exclude one another, judge one another, run one another's lives. How many practice that one? Fix one another. Stop pursuing those one another's. Pursue the one that the Bible teaches over and over again and that Jesus commands, love one another. 
Lastly, this, practice the gift. Practice the gift of Christmas love. We learn to walk one step at a time. We learn to love one loving act at a time. We don't become people of God's great Christmas love by doing one gigantic act of love, though we wish we could. We learn by incorporating love into all the little things we do, just as the Bible teaches. 1 Corinthians 16, let all that you do be done with love. I think we do this. We feel like that surrendering our life to Jesus is kind of like taking a a $1,000 bill, if there was such a thing, and I wish I had one if there were, and we lay it down on the table and we say, here's my life, Lord, I'm giving, I'm giving all this. The, the pastor's message that first Sunday of Advent was so inspiring today that, Lord, I'm giving it all to you right now. All to you. And here's what Jesus does. He gives you the $1,000 back, $1,000 bill back. He says, take this to the bank and cash it in and get a bag of quarters. And you actually go through life putting out 25 cents here, 50 cents here. You listen to your neighbor, neighbor's troubles instead of rushing back inside, 25 cents here. You sign up to serve at school even though you don't want to. You sign up to help even when it's not convenient, 50 cents here. You, you go back to the nursing home the second time, 50 cents there. See, surrendering your life to Christ, becoming like Christ, it, it doesn't seem all that glorious. It's done in little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. We just want to do one big thing and get it over with. But it doesn't work like that. It takes time. It's really slow. Sometimes you have to wait. But eventually you begin to change. God's great love comes through the gift at Christmas of Jesus. And you believe in him. And that love changes you. And that love changes everything. People don't become any more lovable. But you become better at loving them. And you discover that for you, Jesus' love and Jesus' way of life was never about changing them. It was about changing you. As you receive his love, as you pursue his love, as you are changed by his love. Because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have eternal life. The gift of God's love in Jesus is here. Now for all of us, that time has come and the wait is over.